Now it's time to introduce you to our afternoon keynote speaker, Donald Clark. Uh, Donald is no stranger to the e-learning industry and describes himself as a veteran of over 30 years in the e-learning industry. He's just told me now that he's now free from the tyranny of employment, which makes us all feel very good, doesn't it? <laughs> he is also a trustee of the City and Guilds and also of the University for Industry. He's a bit of a globetrotter when it comes to presenting, and he's been in Switzerland, London, Edinburgh, and many other places this year, and is just, as we speak, just back from Africa. So I'd like to invite Donald to join up here on stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, although you can hear, hear from my accent, uh, I'm actually from Scotland. I haven't lived here for 30 years, and I live in Brighton which is as far away from here as you can get without getting wet. Uh, the town that Graham Greene describes as, it looks as though it's been up all night helping the police with their inquiries. And the last time I gave a talk in Glasgow, I thought, no, Glasgow's more appropriate probably for that description. Uh, I can actually pronounce the word murder. And in fact, my, both my kids are English and were brought up in England. And I can remember when I, I first used that word with my kids and I shouted upstairs, you better come down for your tea or I'll murder you. And all I could hear were paroxysms of laughter from my two English kids at the top. What do you mean you're going to murder me? And they have mercilessly rid me with Taggart impersonations of my accent ever since. If you have kids with a different accent, you'll know how weird that is. Really weird when they start mimicking your accent. Anyway, I'm here today to talk. I thought, I'm really going to answer this question, who done it? You know, almost academically, because we've had a couple of thousand years of learning theory. But I'm not too sure that things are so very different today. A lecture in Glasgow or Edinburgh University or any other, Edinburgh, any other university today would be much the same as a lecture that Plato gave in his academy 2,000 years ago. I don't think that much has necessarily changed, and that's pretty weird given the amount of technology we've been discussing today. So what has gone wrong and what has gone right? Uh, as was just mentioned, I'm back from Africa. When I was there, I was speaking to all these ministers of education in Africa, and it was an interesting experience being there. There are different set of problems. But the very first, if we, let's take this, this history, who done it question seriously. The very first piece of technology in our species came out of the Rift Valley, Olduvai Gorge, and it was these simple stone axes. The very first example of a piece of technology where clearly a skill had to be taught. There had to be people who taught other people how to nap these things. It's a real window into the consciousness of early man and woman in our species, because you had to have intent, you had to find this thing, you had to know what you were going to do with this tool, you had to have hand-eye coordination and so on. And for one and a half million years, the stone axe was the dominant piece of technology. I found one actually in where I, near where I live in the Downs, when I, you know, a real sort of treasured possession of mine. But there was something else about stone axes that are quite illustrative of the problem of technology and learning. And that is, these were also found in Africa, and these axes are about a foot wide, the one on the right, a uh, foot tall, the one. In other words, they were non-functional. And sometimes they're very pristine. They were never used as axes. They were clearly used as status objects, just as your current mobile phone is probably as much a status object as a functional object. So we've always had this notion that technology has a sort of cool dimension, which we often forget, I think, in education, because young people get that, which is why my kids demand a, mobile, a new mobile phone from me every two years, they will tell me what contract I'm going to get for them, what model I'm going to get for them. I never negotiated anything with my father. He was an old-fashioned Scots guy who would have rattled me around the ear if I, tried, if I tried to tell him what he was going to buy for me. But the world has changed. Compliant learners are no longer compliant. And of course, there is something remarkable about stone axes and mobiles in the sense that they have always been really ergonomically useful, you know? That sort of personal, powerful, portable tool that you have in your pocket. What's better than that? So what comes around, comes around in a sense. Then it, it, it was interesting, I was doing a lot of writing on the history of technology at one point. And then I, I went deep into the research of cave painting. So about 40,000 years ago, we suddenly had this explosion in consciousness and the most obvious evidence for this are these cave paintings. And cave paintings throughout the 60s and 70s, there was all sorts of shamanistic theories about why cave paintings existed. That's all really gone to one side now. The real academic work has focused on almost these caves being simulators. This is a very strange thing. In other words, I've been in Altamira Cave. When you go into the cave in northern Spain, and you see, way back in the darkness, you see these amazing images by torchlight or oil lamp. 
As it turns out, these are very detailed narratives. And if you've been to Africa and you've seen a lion hunt, you will know how true this is. Those are exactly the poses that lions have as they come across the savanna. Because the speculation now is that when man was both a predator and prey, and it was knowing how to spot animals was good because it might keep you alive, you had to train people to do that. And in the flickering back of a cave, there, there are theories now that these were good narratives teaching young people how to be careful about predators and how to kill your prey. A very interesting, sort of almost like classroom or simulator approach. And then in Africa, of course, we had the invention of writing in Egypt, about 3,400 BC. They gave us papyrus, all the early technology. Writing was the big bang in technology and learning, when we were writing much more important than printing. So lots of interesting things came from Africa. But who done it? Okay. Now, I started a real, this took me about three or four years to go through a lot of detailed reading on theories of learning and theories of technology. Now, this was a fascinating process, but let's start with the modern age, really, which started here with the Greeks. We have Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Now, we talk about the Socratic method all the time, but do we use it much in teaching? I'm not too sure. Socrates was actually a bit of a bully. He used to just sort of hammer his components into the ground like a tent peg, in a sense. But these guys are alive and kicking, and it's not so much Socrates as Plato. Now, Plato had the first university, the academy, which lasted 900 years. That's longer than any existing university. 900 years until Justinian closed it down. But, as I said earlier, I doubt if a lecture in a modern-day university is much different from a lecture that Plato gave in the 4th century BC. And, of course, Plato gave us a very academic view of the world. You know, he was very down on the vocational stuff. And so I think that's also plaguing modern education. You know, we have this highly classical orientated liberal arts agenda, which is killing FE in England. I don't know so much about Scotland, but in England, the further education system has had 17.5% of its budget ripped out, which has gone into HE, by the way, which I think is not blaming FE, but I think that's criminal. I think we're abandoning vocational learning dangerously, even when we know that we need those skills. Another interesting uh, uh, group here were the, the religious leaders. You said, what on earth have they got to do with learning? Well, look at the nine o'clock news last week in England. If you don't think that Mohammed and Christ have anything to do with education, then think of what's happening in the UK this very day. We do have, the, there are some good aspects to this, the, the notion of storytelling and parables from Jesus, for example. Uh, Mohammed, you have the Quran, that literally means to recite. I spent a long time working in the Middle East, and if you do go into schools in the Middle East and even universities, you will see that they're based on recitation and rote learning. That's the truth, guys. And so that's alive and kicking in one whole area of our education system, even in the UK. The Confucian system, again, if you've taught Chinese students, you know there are differences, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, I make no judgments on this, but the fact is that Confucian, Confucius and the Analects give this very clear guidance to students that they really shouldn't be questioning authority, that order mattered, and there was a commitment to society rather than education as an individualistic goal, which is why you get these cultural differences when, for example, Chinese students get lobbed into a, you know, a more individualistic education system. So these religious leaders are, are alive and well. The next two are Calvin and Ignatius. And boy, can I remember the Calvinist education I got in Scotland. You know, I was a bookish child, you know, and I still remember getting my blood vessels burst open by a leather strap by some mad guy who thought he was a sort of, you know, a, you know, a sadomasochist type teacher in my school. And this did happen in my, you know, it did, it did happen to me personally. But Calvinism, no country in Europe took Calvinism more seriously than Scotland. <laughs> we really grasped it by both hands and went for it. And I think it's still there in the system. But remember the downside. If we don't think that Calvin and Ignatius are alive and well in our education system, then think about the sectarian system we have in Scotland in schools and in Northern Ireland. Do we think that's a good thing? I've been out of Scotland for a long time. When my kids come back here, they can hardly believe what their nephews and nieces tell them, that I can't give them a green Christmas present. If you don't think sectarian schooling is a bad thing, I wonder what's going on in Scotland, you know, because I, I never met a Catholic till I was 17 years, 17 years old. A guy called Ronnie Hines, I met him at university, in my first year at university, he was my, he was my best man at my wedding. But this is not good. In other words, these religious influences are still alive and kicking in the, in the educational system. So who did it? Well, these guys are still doing it. Very strongly indeed. Then, I mean, 
Another aspect of this Calvinist notion of teaching is preaching. Because the university lecture really, or the lecture generally in whatever context, does have its origins in religious teaching. And it's a very famous image uh, painted in 1340. The first university in Europe, Bologna. And this artist really nailed it. This is a lecturer with a book up on the right hand side, his students. And of course we can see what the poor guy in the bottom right hand side is doing there, he's fast asleep. Now this artist nailed it. And if, you, if you've been to university and you haven't been bored shitless in a, in a, in a lecture, then I don't know what university you went to. <laughs> because every single student I meet now and ask had good and some really awful experiences lectures. And the fact that the lecture is the, still the primary pedagogic technique in our HE system is just stupid. Because if you look at the other people in this painting, the, the actors really nailed it, not one of them is looking at the lecturer. Not one of them in that painting. And if you go into a modern lecture hall, you'll find, I mean, we don't even count the number of students that turn up to lectures. Talk about big data, we don't have any data. Why do we not collect data? on students attending lectures? Because we'd be scared of the results. Because a lot of them don't necessarily think it's fruitful. Then a really wonderful thing happened, and it happened here in Scotland very precisely, and that's the Enlightenment. So we have Locke, Rousseau, and Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote a brilliant book on education. Rousseau was interesting because it then became learner-centric. Suddenly, motivation, the learner, that notion of natural learning and play came into the, especially early years type stuff through his novel, Emile. He was a bit of an odd character, though he did give away all five of his children at birth to an orphanage, so I'm not too sure about his provenance and background in this. Nevertheless, we did have at that time a reflection on education towards the learner. For the first time in history, really, it was less didactic, but then something really awful happened, and it happened here in Edinburgh. This guy's called James Pillins, and he, tail end of the Enlightenment, invented the blackboard. Suddenly, teachers started walking to the back of the room, turning their back on learners, and I went to Edinburgh University, I can remember physics and maths lectures in Appleton Tower, or whatever it was, and I still remember these guys wandering in, chalking up maths, top left board, three boards wide, 50 minutes turning their back to you. And this still happens today. The chalkboard has been an abomination in terms of teaching. It has absolutely driven the teacher back to broadcasting stuff for a solid hour, hour and a half or whatever, and it does nobody any good whatsoever. Uh, but it's still the dominant pedagogy of the day. The, the, the whole blackboard thing is a bit odd in many ways, you know? And it's gone through to whiteboards and no doubt PowerPoint and all sorts of things since then. But a, a, a tradition that's alive and kicking, but it came from Scotland originally. Then another good thing happened. William James, the father of psychology, the principles of psychology, and John Dewey, learning by doing suddenly became interesting for all those who work in FE, whom I greatly admire and I think is underfunded and shouldn't be. The whole learning by doing thing sort of got rattled and squeezed out of the education system because we believed in high-end academic achievement. So it barely exists in many contexts now. We're busily trying to get it back, but south of the border, Gove is killing it. Every single vocational subject has been killed in schools, and yet he still wants Latin, still wants a dead language taught in his schools. Another perhaps destructive side of the Scottish character, and Mr. Michael Gove. Nevertheless, Dewey and James brought the psychology of learning. He brought some science to the table, which I think was interesting. Then a bit of a downside in terms of, uh, uh, we had this big Marxist push uh, uh, throughout the early part of this century. Marx never wrote anything really about education, but he did believe that all knowledge was a social construct. And then we have Habermas, Gramsci, uh, a, a whole number of people who did write in detail, mainly about the state's dominance of children, trying to sort of feed them into a sort of capitalist system and so on. That was useful because I think there's some truth to that. Even today, there is absolutely no doubt that politicians want to use the educational system for their political goals. However, the downside of this was that we also got out of that social constructivist. I have to say, Although, it's just, although it is the orthodoxy, I am not a social constructivist. I don't even know what the theory is. And when I ask people what social constructivism is, they can barely mention a single text that they've read or seen. They certainly have not read Thought and Language by Vygotsky, and they couldn't defend any of the theses against the Chomskyan attack on it. In other words, social constructivism is a sort of two words that float around in education, like learning styles. 
You know, no science, no real background to it, but it's become a sort of orthodoxy that we all learn in a social construct, which is a, a Marxist a, 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 a concept originally. And I think actually slightly destructive, to be honest. But science isn't the answer to everything. We had the behaviorists, Pavlov, from Pavlov uh, through Thorndike. Nice, he was a good guy in the sense of transfer of skills from doing simulations, I'll, I'll mention this later. Uh, uh, right through to Skinner, who was still teaching at Harvard in the 19... Uh, 1980s, and then we have psychoanalysis. Suddenly we had this from nowhere, the idea from Freud, Erickson, Rogers, that counselling, and even today there are inset days in the English schooling system, there's, current, there's always one, and the one on the go at the moment is mindfulness. You can go into an inset day in an English school and get, readily get a training course in mindfulness. It will not go away, this focus on counselling in the unconscious. And I am not convinced by us adults imposing every little liberal fad that comes along onto teachers because it's the a la mode topic. I don't think it does teachers much good, to be honest. And then we have these schooling people, we know people, uh, Montessori, Steiner, and so on, we're talking less about schools than those, really. And then more schooling, don't worry about this. But this is where it really came alive for me. The first person here is Ebbinghaus, 1885, who showed us the forgetting curve that every teacher should know in their very bones because most of what I am telling you now, you will absolutely forget before you hit the taxi or car tonight. It's a fact, it's science that you forget almost everything. If you're not taking any notes, you absolutely will forget it all because you've got no reinforcement at all. Despite the fact that we knew this in 1885 and we've had 120, 130 years of research showing that space practice works, what do we do about that? We do nothing, we do absolutely nothing. The most important principle in the psychology of learning was abandoned and never, nobody pays any attention to it. There's something totally bizarre about this. Because the forgetting curve is a real thing and the way to stop forgetting is to have repeated practice over time, afterwards, and you can do this, but we don't make, and it is difficult. You know, when the students walk out the door, how do you get them? Well, they all have mobile phones, that's one answer to that problem, but there are other ways of doing it. Chunking is the other one. Uh, which we now see in MOOCs and other phenomena, in other words, the atomization of content, which is terribly important. The psychology of learning always tells us that less is more, and yet a lot of our teaching practices result in cognitive overload because we try too much too quickly. And then we have Addison uh, and that whole notion of memory. This was a really wonderful insight here when we saw that memory had a sort of tripartite structure, short and long-term memory, still perhaps one of the most important things to understand as a teacher, especially working memory. So Badley's theory of working memory, he unpacked working memory, that's the little gap at the top of the bottle. If you don't really understand how that works, then you're in real trouble, especially in teaching young children, because they have real problems. Not with Miller's seven plus and minus two, the paper that often gets presented at teacher training contexts, but the real fact that the register is not seven, but probably two or three. So a lot of teaching results directly in cognitive overload because we misunderstand how really narrow working memory is. So we're, we're really starting to get somewhere here with regard to science and teaching and learning. And then we have uh, uh, this whole notion from, uh, from, from tooling of episodic and semantic memory. Now, for those of you who are using technology, this is perhaps the most important distinction in the science of memory and learning. The idea that when you now recall something you had or somebody you spoke to at lunchtime, you get that sort of snapshot video type recall, that's episodic memory, autobiographical memory. Semantic memory is if I ask you to do two plus two equals four in your mind, you'll bring back the semantic, symbolic nature of that knowledge. And yet, in the education system today, we still are too text-based. And we saw that this morning, that wonderful presentation this morning when we had a flip into video and audio and it felt refreshing because we had got away from text. We're not appealing to semantic memory because semantic memory isn't that useful for lots of learning tasks. Episodic memory should be used appropriately, but it's not. We're far too text-based in education. Far too many essays. You know, not only do we have the one-hour lecture, which is only one hour because the Babylonians had a base 60 number system. It's got nothing to do with the psychology of learning. Absolutely nothing. But we also have the essay as the pedagogic technique in our higher education system. We know that this is not right. There are lots of alternatives in terms of assessment, which we ignore. And then deliberate practice. This notion 
that you really have to practice. You know, the most important variable in most learning is actually practiced by the learner, repeated access, repeated application of the knowledge and skills in a real world context. And yet that's the bit that's often missing. It's the bit that's often missing, the deliberate practice. And here we have uh, the wonderful work, work done by Ericsson on that and other cues. To give you an example of this, I, I went to a great talk by a sports, uh, it, was, it was a guy who was the Britain's number one table tennis champion for 10 years, a guy called Syed. And he said, oh yeah, it was 10 years. That was impressive. But his next sentence was even more amazing. He said, the next five people on the league table in Britain all came from the two streets next to me. I just said, whoa, whoa, whoa. That is absolutely astounding. Forget all that bollocks about talent management and natural talent. What happened there? He said, well, we just practiced more. We had a table tennis club that was open 24 hours. We had a brilliant teacher, a brilliant coach, terribly important, and we just slammed it. Practice, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. That's what matters. And yet we still have that notion of inherent talent in kids. Uh, in, in the corporate training of talent management companies, it's all gone seriously wrong, in my opinion, in that area. But then we have some sort of really sort of weird people that come into, uh, into the shape here. These are, you might call them instructionalists. I don't know how many of you have to suffer that thing in e-learning courses when the very first screen is, and the objectives of this course, at the end of this course, you will remember, you know that sort of trainer teacher speak that just bores everybody shitless in the first screen? I don't know, you know, ask a 10 year old what the web is like. When I go on the EasyJet uh, site to fly up here, I don't get, and the objective of this website is that you'll get very cheap fares and you'll sit in an orange seat, slightly uncomfortable, well, that's it. You know, it doesn't say that sort of stuff. That's not what the web is. If you're going to teach somebody, grab them by the throat. A good teacher walks into a classroom and a good teacher is in the classroom before the kids arrive and they know they have to get the attention. You daren't turn your back on them. And yet, what do we do? We give them learning objectives. Why? Because Mega wrote a book called Performance Objectives. A guy called Gangye put it as one of his first steps in his nine steps of instruction book. It got logged into teacher training courses and train the trainer courses, and it's been there for nearly 40 years without being moved. That's why we do it. It's old theory. Cole, Bloom, some of this stuff is really old, 50-year-old theory that's still encapsulated in many of these courses. And we know that the research has moved on from that, but it got worse. Then we had Abraham Maslow. Now, I don't know how many of you as teachers find a, a Maslow's a pyramid of needs a really useful thing when you walk into a classroom. I think it's only there because it's a really pretty PowerPoint slide. You know that nice triangle. It's fossilized in the teach, teacher training courses. And it, it's, I don't know if you've read Maslow. In reading Maslow, it makes you want to weep. He was an armchair theorist. He admitted himself he had no empirical evidence for anything he ever wrote. And it's an impoverished view of human nature. It's oversimplistic and doesn't really matter. Any of you think that you walk into that room with those 30 kids armed with Maslow and it helps? then you've got to convince me because I ain't convinced. With McLuhan, I think was more useful. And then Seligman, the happy guy, suddenly, I don't know if you remember that period a couple of years ago where happiness was the big thing in education, where everybody had to be happy. Bugger that, I may be an old sort of Calvinist, but <laughs> I don't buy this. I don't buy this happiness. You know, every Farish theory that comes along, teachers have got to buy into it. I don't think so. Learning is bloody hard. Learning a language, as we said earlier this morning, is a bloody hard thing. You don't do it by being relentlessly chuckly and happy. You just don't. Actually, most of what you learn is in the quiet of your own room in that silence in a deeply serious, deeply processed, uh, 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 reflective process. It's nothing to do with being happy or entertained all the time. But you think that's bad. Then pop psychology really took a flourish with these guys. So we have Bandler. And NLP is still taught in some of our universities and colleges. NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Nothing to do with neurology, linguistics, or programming. Bandler, by the way, killed his uh, drug dealer's girlfriend with a Colt 45. That, what a lovely guy. What a lovely guy, you know? And he's still floating around the world giving talks on NLP and charging you five grand a pop for absolute garbage. Absolute garbage. In fact, type NLP into Google one day and see what you find. You will find sites that teach guys how to hypnotize women in bars for sex. Because NLP is based on a pseudo form of hypnosis. It's a lie. It's a manipulative technique that we should not allow in the educational system. And then we have, the, I don't know if you know the history of learning styles, why I abhor learning styles theory. But Fleming, the next guy, was the guy who gave us VAK, remember that? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. 
My kids at school in England got badges with VAK written on them, and I went apeshit. How dare you fucking stereo, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> See, in England, you don't get away with swearing. People are on Twitter, oh my God, he swore. Scotland, nobody gives a toss. But they, you know, visual and auditory, there is no scientific basis to this whatsoever. And yet it invaded the educational system. It's still alive and kicking. And in the corporate training world, Honey and Mumford's learning styles. Mr. Honey really hates me because I'm blogging constantly saying, drop this stuff before it gets too late. It's stereotyping people. In fact, the very last thing you should do with a visual learner is feed them more visual stuff. We should be teaching them to read. You should be doing the very opposite of what the learning styles theorists uh, often appeal to, in a sense. Then, the obsession with exams. Boy, has that become an obsession. You know, I think my, you may as well wire my kids up to a perpetual testing machine, you know, from birth, the way things are going in education. It's doing nobody any good and completely and utterly out of hand. And Cyril Burt, I was the last cohort in Scotland to sit the 11 plus. There's a few in the room who will probably remember that. And that was because of this idiot here. Cyril Burt actually falsified his results. Completely wrong. Actually lied about the research, but it led because he had power. Sir Cyril Burt, he had power in Parliament, and he was the guy behind the, the 11 plus exam, which is still alive and kicking in some parts of England. And then we have iSync, the IQ guy, and Gardner. And again, I'm not a fan of multiple intelligence, mainly because it's curiously maps quite nicely onto the school curriculum. I'm not too sure that it's truly a set of cognitive uh, intelligences, uh, uh, or rather subject intelligences, so I'm not too sure about this. I'll skip to these two, because after the brilliant presentation this morning on feedback, two of the people I really admire most in education is Black and William. And you know, of all the people I've read in the 20th century in education, these are the two that matter most to me because they just concentrate relentlessly on one word, and that's feedback. And if you want to really go into some detail here, and these are quite radical, especially Professor Black, because they say, don't even mark. If you're doing formative feedback, as was explained by Russell this morning, why on earth are you doing A, A minus, and marking essays and other assignments? Why are you marking? Leave marking to summative assessment. But as we say, we all know, we've all been through that process where we get an essay back with well done, A+. Plus. Needs more detail. Stupidly vague feedback. As we got shown this morning, feedback needs to be detailed, constructive, helpful. Marks are not helpful. Marks are endpoints, terminal points for learners. Even bright kids, if they get 85%, stop there and don't look at the other 15%. And we've become obsessed by marking and not good formative feedback. But we got a masterclass in that this morning. Don't worry about the rest of the people here. Right, okay. Any questions on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a thousand. <laughs> any, seriously, though, any questions on that, on that before I just move into the bit where I'm going to say, listen, I'm going to give you some things that I think I've learned from these people? No? Okay, let's move on. This may seem like a wholly uh, hyperbolic statement. There's been more pedagogic change in the last 15 years than the last one and a half million years. Doesn't that sound odd? in a way, but I do think it's true. I do think it's true. And that pedagogic change has come about not because of those learning theorists or departments of education, even in universities or whatever. It's come because of the massive brain type network that is the internet. And we have Tim Berners-Lee, you'll recognize some of these faces anyway, obviously. Mr. Microsoft, the late, great. Mr. Jobs, the guys behind Google, we have uh, Mr. Jimmy Wales of Wikipedia, still absolutely astounding example of something that had nothing to do with education, came out of nowhere, and is still the biggest and most important knowledge base on the planet. When you go to Africa and speak to people about Wikipedia, you get a different reaction. You don't get, oh, well, it's full of little errors, isn't it? You get, God, I just want it and I want more of it. It's often the only knowledge base in their language. In fact, they're so thirsty for it, they now have an SMS message on $10 phones so that you can get Wikipedia delivered text by text. Isn't that amazing how thirsty they are for that sort of knowledge and how scoffing we are? I've just finished a long research project on Wikipedia showing not only that every single student and child on the planet uses it, every one of your students use it, not only that, but teachers also use it for lesson preparation, although they tend to tell the students not to use it. We're in that sort of transition at the moment. But let's face it, it's absolutely marvelous. Then we have Jeff Bezos, of course, Zuckerberg, Can, and then some new kids in the block. Who are doing business now? Because there's a new group of guys in the block now. We have Sebastian Thrun, Peter Norvig of Google, uh, Daphne Kohler, and Andrew Nigg, of course, Sarah, 
And this guy, you might not know at the end here, but he just sold his company to Google for 400 million after two years. And he is a psychologist, a genius mathematician, and all he sold to Google were a couple of algorithms around machine learning. And I'll explain why this is important. Because over the last 15 years, when Google started to kick in about 1999, 2000, from then onwards, things changed pedagogically for all of us and every single learner on the planet. Because Google was an example of what I'll call MOOCs, a massive open online pedagogy. Suddenly, there was a new pedagogy on the block, and that was, of course, search. And why was, why, is Google such a, why was it such a massive pedagogic shift? Well, look at, the, or look at the statement that Google make. I wish a university or a college would have the statement to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. What an absolutely marvelous goal. Are they meeting that goal? I think they're pretty much getting that. It was a radical pedagogic shift for all learners because you could, at your fingertips, find things out. And you could have that notion that knowledge didn't have to be uh, loaded up in, uh, into long-term memory to be useful. It could be at your fingertips. Well, I, I've run companies all my life, and I just dropped that whole notion of learning lots of HR stuff and so on because I knew I could just go to Google and find the answer very quickly. Managers and teachers and so on had to less know, funnily enough, to be functional because they didn't have to load up their long-term memory with the manuals, in a sense. The second big massive open on online pedagogy was the hyperlink. So when people talk about Twitter, people have been tweeting all morning here. That's been quite useful. But the really useful thing in Twitter is often the link at the end. You know, when people say, oh, Twitter's a load of rubbish, it's just people saying, oh, I've just had a cup of tea. I've never seen anybody tweet, I've just had a cup of tea. That's people who have never used things trying to do it down in a sense. It's incredibly useful because of hyperlinking. It's what makes social media work. It's what makes Wikipedia work. Because the brain is not a linear recording system like a video recorder. The brain is a network of knowledge. And if you feed a new piece of knowledge into that network, it has to be sensitive to the existing knowledge that the learner has. And all our learning systems are based on the linear feed. We have linear one-hour lectures. We have linear videos. We have linear texts. We have linear books. But we know with absolute certainty that that's the wrong format by and large because the mind prefers things to be selected on the basis which its network needs. The memory does not store things alphabetically, hierarchically, or linearly in any sense whatsoever, which is why people love social media. It sort of appeals to that human need for this one. The next one is video. I mean, in a sense, we had audio this morning, but also video, I think, a terribly important medium. Ask any 12-year-old how long a piece of instructional video should be. How many would say one hour? None. One hour is an absolute hopeless length. Of course, it shouldn't be any determinant length. Actually, what the research shows, largely through huge amounts of data coming back through MOOCs, is that the maximum length for a piece of recorded instructional video should be about six minutes. That's about as much as we can bear. And it's about as much as attention holds, but it's also the right length because we need to stop and reflect, digest, and deprocess that knowledge. If you just let it run for the hour like a lecture, it just skates over the surface, which is why recording lectures is an absolute necessity. I was amazed last week to get a tweet uh, and, uh, showing that the students at Edinburgh University have uh, a petition, an online petition, against the university, trying to convince the university that they should record lectures. Isn't that amazing that the students are actually demanding it and that they don't do it anyway? Why on earth wouldn't you record lectures? Where on earth did this idea that you say something once to a learner and that's it is virtuous? If you were a novelist, you wouldn't write a novel and say, I'm not going to put it in a book. No, I'll publish it. You must be mad. You're going to stand here and listen to my novel once and take notes. If you were a journalist, you wouldn't say, I'm going to write my article, but I'm not going to put it in a newspaper. You better listen, take notes. But that's what, that's what, where did we get this idea that it's even remotely useful in education? Of course, learners need, absolutely need repeated access, several bites of the cherry, to learn anything. That's what the psychology of learning tells us. That's why lectures are of no use whatsoever, unless, in a sense, they're recorded and people have access to them. And if you have English as a second language, you want to stop, reflect, rewind, drill down at some depth, if you're dyslexic, also, there are all sorts of reasons why you might want to have recorded lectures. But the time has come where it has to be universalized. And the most recent research is absolutely fascinating here. Eric Mazur, the man who perhaps knows more about this topic as an academic and researcher than anybody else on the planet, I think, 
has come to the conclusion that it's almost unethical to be lecturing if you have this data. And what he means is the meta-studies comparing lectures to other forms of active learning. And I highly recommend that you have a look at this. But will it happen? No. And I understand it because the cultural inertia in organisations around building lecture halls in Brighton, the University of Sussex have just built another three. Why? I do not know. Because the occupancy rates in educational establishments are fiendishly low. Fiendishly low. They should be spending the money on other online solutions. And then we have social media. I've mentioned Wikipedia already, that absolute gem of a thing. I think you should get the Nobel Prize for that one. Interestingly, the Encyclopedia Britannica was a Scottish thing as well, first published in Edinburgh, uh, again, uh, in the Enlightenment period. Very interesting, William Smelly, his modus operandi when he created uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica that was absolutely gone now, of course. I wrote most of it, my lad, and snipped out from books enough material for the printer. With paste pot and scissors, I composed it. So, Encyclopedia Britannica, that great standard of knowledge, was actually just a whole bunch of plagiarized stuff in the first place. You know, who are they to say that Wikipedia is wrong? And then some interesting stuff around Facebook and Twitter. I won't go into too much detail here, but if you are a learning professional, if you really are a learning professional, especially in this context, the just, if you do want to find things out, keep up to date, collaborate, all that jazz, I'd be amazed if you just don't use social media. <laughs> you know, it is absolutely the wellspring of knowledge for me as an individual. I don't go on courses. I take MOOCs, but I, I'm not going to go back to university or college. I'm 57 years old, for God's sake. You know? But I learn an enormous amount through these media. And it's terribly important that we pay attention to that and feed that beast because you're far more likely to find one of your students on Facebook than in your institution very often. And then one of the things that I think, it sounds easy, this, this big data thing, but there isn't big data in education. It's not like terabytes of da data that apply when you do a Google search. That doesn't exist. Actually, most of the data in education, not even how many students turn up to lectures, most of the data is just how many bums have been on seats, uh, the results of summative assessment at the end of the year and perhaps dropout rates, you know, and some happy sheet stuff, the happy sheet stuff. Where did that come from? The most useless piece of data imaginable, absolutely rife at conferences in education. It doesn't tell you anything about the learner. And bums on seats is looking at the wrong end of the learner. What data should be doing is real-time diagnosis of what's going on cognitively in the heads of students. And let me explain why there's a revolution on the go now on this. A big thing is happening. If, as we do, we use all these sort of things, every time you search in Google, a whole ensemble of algorithms is coming to every letter you type into that box. It knows in advance what you're trying to ask it and is desperately trying through algorithmic and mathematical power to find the answer. The same is true of Amazon. It not only knows what books you didn't buy, how long you spent on those books that you looked at and you didn't buy, but how long you've looked at other sites that sell similar items to Amazon. That's why you should clear out your cookies every time you search for the next travel deal, because those cookies are often telling them that you're a fairly wealthy middle class people and we can bump the price up by a tenner. Clear your cookies. Facebook, similarly, Netflix, they actually went to the market and got a couple of bright kids to come up with an algorithmic engine that results in 75% of their ongoing sales. And they are a big global media company now. And then tar the, tar the famous Target story. Target, if you go into one, every one horse town in America, you see a Target. They now know when women are pregnant before those women tell them they're pregnant. That's how the predictive power of these things is happening in retail. And they do that because women tend to buy items that don't have additives and so on in them when they're pregnant. And so they have that data and they come back. There's a very famous case, which is very famous now, of the father whose daughter got the voucher for baby clothes. She was only 15. He went into Target, going ape shit, you know, it's a big a $10 million lawsuit here, only to discover, of course, that his daughter was in fact pregnant. Target knew his daughter was pregnant before he knew she was pregnant. It's pretty frightening, some of this stuff. And if you use eHarmony or Match.com, they'll be using algorithms based on successful data. And I was, what types of couples get together and does that uh, lead to long-standing relationships and marriage? It's coming to play there. Even the World Cup now. I highly recommend a book called The Numbers Game, which looks at data in soccer, football, and absolutely amazingly counterintuitive stuff, like corners don't matter. You know, so if you go to football, you know, go, what? what do you mean corners don't matter? They don't matter at all. There's almost zero cor uh, correlation between the number of corners and winning games. And when Marino, manager, uh, 
if Chelsea came to England, he was amazed that English supporters would cheer when they got a corner because in Spain nobody gives a toss because the data tells you it's irrelevant. So a counterintuitive thing. But of course our minds are full of counterintuitive things. And how are we going to use this in education? Well, here in Scotland, this may surprise you, you have one of the most important companies in the field, but you, you won't know them, but they're based in Edinburgh called Cog Books, run by a research physicist, very, very bright guy, mathematician by background. And what they do is all their customers are in education in the US. They have none in the UK, mainly because they have a more advanced uh, investment in, in, uh, in look at adaptive learning. They were rated by the Gates Foundation as the premier company in adaptive learning on the planet. And they're based in Edinburgh. And nobody in Scotland's heard of them, or England for that matter. But have a look at them, because what they do is like a sat-nav in learning for the learner. So imagine having a sat-nav that knows where you as a learner are coming from, where you're going, and if you go off-piste, it knows you've gone off-piste and tries to get you back on again. What it delivers is not e-learning in that linear sort of fashion that we've seen before, but every single screen is decided by an ensemble of 22 algorithms that are personalized to that individual. So it's delivering the e-learning in real time according to your needs. And I've taught mathematics to young kids before, and it's a fiendishly difficult subject to teach and learn, but you really do need that personalized. It's really difficult to diagnose what was wrong in a child's head when they don't get maths. This is working wonders, this stuff at the moment. And indeed, we're getting the early data through, showing, showing that it not only leads to less dropout, but significant increase in attainment. And that brings me to higher education, or you know, let's call it further education as well, because something really amazing has happened here, I think, and you may not like this term, but I absolutely love this phenomenon. 23 million people have looked at MOOCs worldwide. I've taken eight myself, and four of them have been superior to the courses I had at the two universities I went to. And one was an Ivy League in the States, and the other was Edinburgh University. Don't imagine that these are Mickey Mouse courses. They are not. Some of them are absolutely superb, and we have a lot to learn from them. But there are several myths around here. One is the idea that they're going to replace universities and colleges. That's not going to happen. In 100 years, your universities and your institutions will be here, because this is not about 18-year-old undergraduates, that model which the university so loves. It's a new model, and it's not about, remember what the higher education system is at the moment. I've got twin boys. If I put them through a three or four year degree, I'd have 9,900 pounds a year times 12, like let's, let's call that 20 grand a year, okay? For three years, that's 60 grand. They'd, use, they'd lose 15 grand a year in lost earnings. That's another 35, 45 grand, plus all the living expenses. You're talking about me or somebody having to come up with 100 and odd grand for my kids' two degrees. Is that starting to be worth it? I don't think so. I don't think so, honestly. I think the whole thing's got out of hand. And in the States, you know, the Ivy League I went to, it's 30, $40,000 a year for tuition. The whole thing has tumbled out of control now. And we must look at cheaper ways of delivering education or we're in real trouble. In Africa, only about three or 4% of Africans have a remote chance of even getting to university. And we think universities are the answer. Do they want to take a system that doesn't even work in our world into their world? I think not. We must look at alternatives using technology. And then the dropout thing, it really annoys me this term dropout. You know, university dropout, college dropout, society dropout. When you take an English word from that catastrophic context and then lump it over and apply it to MOOCs, you're making what Gilbert Ryle used to call a category mistake. People who just stopped doing MOOCs, and four of them I, I stopped, I'm not, I'm not a dropout. I'm just amazed that 23 million people have dropped in. You know, I'm a drop in. And, you know, if I stop halfway down a Wikipedia page, somebody doesn't go back with it. Oh, so Donald, Donald's a dropout in Wikipedia. Isn't that terrible? Oh, that Wikipedia, what a load of rubbish. But that's what's happening in MOOCs. The backlash is just absolutely brutal and irrational because it's okay to drop out. You know, there's lots of window shoppers in those programs. There's lots of things happening, but it's cool to drop out. Stopping is rational because even when you speak to people who drop out of these courses, like the great data from Edinburgh, I really admire what Edinburgh did in their six Coursera courses. You find that people love these courses. The demand is huge for this stuff amongst long, uh, lifelong learning, and especially vocational learning. I'll come to that in a moment. And oh, well, they're just all graduates that take it. Well, of course it's all graduates because they're the only people who've heard the MOOCs. They were the only group that they were marketed to. I've started tech companies all my adult life, and you go through a predictable process, and it's called the innovation uh, uh, adoption life that cycle, and you've heard of the phrase early adopters. Of course, in the first two phases of a launch of any product, it's early adopters. And they are going to be the sort of people that bought the early mobile phones, but of course, you move into the majority into the middle, and that's starting to happen in the MOOC data. You find that it's not just people who are already graduates. 
they're being marketed to other people. And that's terribly important. Because this is not about the 18-year-old undergraduate. It's not just about higher education. It's really about lifelong learning, vocational learning, all the subjects of computer science, business, STEM, vocational, corporate, MOOCs. Loads of players are coming into this market now. And it's an incredibly healthy thing for all of us. The democratization of learning, this intermediation of learning, and the fact that people have a chance to do something which doesn't cost them a lot of money, but is nevertheless life enhancing. And these are not simple. You've got really sophisticated, adaptive MOOCs, all sorts of things coming through. Are they poor pedagogically? Another charge that's made to them? I think not. I just compare them to what I got and what students are still getting in a sense. You know, nobody in their right mind puts a one hour lecture up in a MOOC because nobody would take the damn thing. And yet we still have that in the existing system. It's short videos, less is more, anytime, anywhere, many times, focus on content, the data on teaching. Lots of teachers who actually participate in MOOCs have an incredibly fruitful experience because it makes them reflect on their practice and improve in themselves, I think. I think that's a, a, a very useful thing because you don't often have that chance. And a good example is Keith Devlin at Stanford who delivers the mathematical thinking course and has for many years at math, a really well-respected course. The lecture video delivers me in a way the student has complete control over making it self-evidently better. That's interesting that the control the student has over the video makes it self-evidently better. I really do believe that that's true. His second quote, the fact is a student taking my MOOC can make a closer connection with me than in a class of more than 25 and certainly more than a class of 250 with a massification of further and higher education. It's impossible to give the level of feedback which Russell talked about this morning on a face-to-face -face basis. And we know that when people are doing videos, some really wonderful pedagogic shifts have taken place here. When Khan Academy came along, you didn't see Salman Khan for the good reason that his head is noise. When you're teaching mathematics, his head has nothing to do with the maths. He shows you the maths. And yet most recorded lectures were shot from the back of the lecture hall with this tiny little figure on a blackboard. No, that's not how you teach maths. That's not how you shoot it. This is how you do maths. This is what Udacity did when 169,000 people, me included one of them, actually did an incredibly challenging AI course. As good as anything I ever saw in a university. Are they weak in assessment? Well, first of all, the Edinburgh data showed something interesting. That only 33% of people who did their six MOOCs, 380,000 people, we're actually interested in certification anyway. I wasn't interested in the paper. Some people are, but let's not get carried away with regard to certification as a necessary condition for success. If you do want it, though, you should try ProctorU online assessment. You go to their website, you show them your passport, you type a little thing, because we all have a unique little fingerprint in our typing pattern. You show your webcam around the room, and you sit an online exam. How brilliant is that? And you can do it any day. You don't have to wait once a year till the end of the year. That's the model. That's the future of assessment not sitting in one of those invigilated rooms once a year, cramming for it and then forgetting a lot afterwards. Can they, they be monetized? Of course they can. Because this is not just private capital that's coming in here. There are charities, all sorts of people playing in this game now, and it will go on. Whatever you may say, people keep on making them, and people keep on taking them. This will be up to 100 million shortly in terms of people who have accessed this stuff. Lots of ways you make money, don't worry about the detail here. Also, I think employers are increasing. I've, I've been an employer all my adult life. I would love a kid who came along and had done a programming MOOC. More so than, funny enough, a college or university MOOC, because I think that individual would have showed some, some motivation for doing it themselves. You know? And in sort of way, I would admire, because most of the programmers I had learned most of their coding not in college anyway. They learned a lot of it on their own. That's what they're smart, bright people who become very self-sufficient and learn from other coders. And that's, that's interesting in itself. Another brilliant example from Scotland that probably nobody's heard of. Interactive Design Institute in Edinburgh. They were FE people who went out, started a little company, and are delivering online degrees, wholly online, no synchronous webcams, nothing, wholly asynchronous, with a massive amounts of feedback, just as Russell described this morning. Their system is absolutely superb. They're delivering BAs in graphic design, photography, and so on and so forth. Now, these are quite practical subjects. The interesting thing is they're full degree courses, accredited, uh, sorry, the, they were the first fully online courses to be approved by the QAA in Britain, here in Scotland. South Hertfordshire uh, is the name of the university that gives out the degrees. The interesting thing about the students who do those degrees is that every single year they outperform their campus colleagues. 
Why do you think they outperform their campus colleagues? It's quite difficult, this, because they may be just more motivated, because they tend to be a little bit older, you know, mothers with kids who don't want to go to campus. Actually, the reason they attribute is what Russell said this morning. The detailed construct, when you submit a poster, let's say for design, the tutor has time to give that constructive feedback that you so brilliantly showed this morning. It's archived off, it goes to the student. They have the time to reflect on that, come back with their response. And that sort of dialectic between teacher and student is immensely detailed and archived and constructive in a way that the campus students don't really get. They get good feedback, but it's verbal, often forgotten, not archived, and therefore poorer. Absolutely wonderful organization here. And of course, things happening on assessment. We know that assessment is incredibly crude in many ways. And I think it's well illustrated by this famous example. Uh, you know, every kid in the land has had to get this question, find X, Pythagoras' theorem, and the answer will be five. And of course, the, the answer, which everybody loves on this one, is find X. Here it is, says the kid. Now, who would you rather employ? The millions of kids who know that it's five and can apply Pythagoras' theorem. I'm 57 years old, I don't know about you. I have never used Pythagoras' theorem in my entire puff. Uh, but I really love the kid who says, here it is, a bit, of a, a bit of a wit. You can tell he's going to be personable, a bit of lateral thinking, interesting thing. Teacher's response in red pen, cross zero. <laughs> Marking cross zero. Ah, give him a prize, move him on. We're testing the wrong bloody things and we know it. Feedback, coming back to Russell's thing, is terribly more. I've talked about this a lot more. On vocational learning, I think something really interesting thing is happening through technology as well. I don't know, how many, how many of you have tried the Oculus Rift out in the hall here? Great. Well, that is just a fourth sort of taste of what's coming here. I saw some brilliant vocational programs, simulations in the States last year, and this one was in gas inspection. It's a real job, folks, you know? And lots of kids have to be trained up for corgi gas inspection, now it's called something else. But if you really want to do this, you can not only train them, you can assess them, you can certify them, and that's happened in the States already, and it will happen here, right down to individual competencies. Some wonderful things happening here. And lots of really good technology things coming along in the assessment front, including machine assessment of essays. This will interest Russell. Imagine, if we get to the position, because we're really close, that when you compare human marked essays with machine marked essays, they're very, very similar. Now think of the amount of time that you spend marking that stuff. Imagine that disappearing. Wouldn't that be a blissful thing? Essay assessment, real-time feedback, adaptive assessment simulations, that's all coming into the assessment region. To take the pressure off teachers, there's no reason why you should be doing all that assessment if it can be done automatically, and many things can be done. And let me end on this thing here. This is the Oculus Rift. This is the mask you wear. I really highly recommend you give it a go outside because we're moving away from the sort of gamesy world of first-person shooters into first-person thinkers where we're learning real skills that we really will apply in the outside world when we leave college or university or school. Facebook bought it for two damn billion. Two billion! Because they have one and a half billion customers and they will sell millions of these things. And in the press release, Zuckerberg put education in the press release. Facebook have never gone near education before, but they will now. And why is this important? Well, let me just show you this little bit of video to show you the sort of visceral reaction you get when you try this thing. This guy's on a roller coaster, and the guy behind him gives a little nudge. This thing. I've been teaching kids physics using this program, which is you're in a spacesuit, the visor comes up, you're floating around the space station, you actually see with one image of your kid. So if you're teaching Newton's three laws, if you're teaching the third law, F equals minus F, every action is equal and opposite reaction, you get them to press the spacesuit and they move forward. That is F equals minus F. You try teaching Newton's three laws from a blackboard and a bit of paper. It takes about a year for the kids to get the concept. Then when they press the spacesuit and they keep on going and crash into the space station because Newton's first law says that a body will move in, at the same speed ad infinitum until another force acts upon it, a very counterintuitive law in physics. It takes ages to get it. The kid will get it immediately the first time they crash into the space station and you explain it. Newton's second law, uh, first law done. 
And then the middle law, I think, was four sequence mass times acceleration. You have to explain how the space station got up there in the first place by the application of a force and accelerating it into orbit. And then you can explain how this thing is moving. It's actually coming overhead tonight. You can actually see it from Scotland, the space station, about 10, 11 o'clock. It's moving at 17,000 miles an hour, 230 miles up in the air. It's, it's a visceral thing for a kid to learn physics in that concept, that way. This one, I'm walking along the bottom of the ocean. I've been using this in biology to explain food chains. So you have the humpback whales, 60,000 of those left. They travel about 1,200 miles every year to breed in the tropics. Uh, there's a shark there as well. And you can move around, you can look around this. You are absolutely in a 3D world here and teach whatever you want. And here you're coming up to a hydrothermal vent. So the water's coming out, you can teach geology, geography, by being there. Because in simulations, you can do what you can never do in the classroom. You can do the impossible. Simulations aren't about simulating the real world, they're about doing things that are impossible. I wouldn't have flown up on EasyJet yesterday if my pilot hadn't spent 300 hours on his flight simulator. Why on earth are we not applying simulations to education? Well, the reason is the pilots go down with their plane. They know that it matters, and we should think that it matters as educators. This one's teaching the French Revolution, so I'm on the block here in 1793, like Marie Antoinette, that's the basket into which my head's going to drop. This one's perhaps got more ethical problems, <laughs> but I'm looking up at the guillotine, it comes down, my head's in the basket, I'm looking back up at the guillotine. I'll tell you, I'd ask a question at the end of that session with a whole load of kids, which is, when was the last guillotine death in France? What year do you think it was? Anybody any idea? Any idea? You were close, 1977. 1977, they were still chopping people's heads off. I'll tell you, see, once you hear that stat, you never forget it after that program. Deep processing, deep learning, transfer learning to the real world, that's what this stuff starts to offer. And uh, we've been funding all sorts of things here. One uh, from an organization I'm a trustee of. One is social care. We know the ethical problems in social care homes and the way pe old people are treated. How do you teach those competencies? Do you really teach them in a classroom using PowerPoint? from manuals, or do you actually get them to experience what it's like to work in a care home and actually experience what it's like to have poor vision if you're an elderly person? <coughs> Let me see it. Uh, so, sorry, I don't worry about that one. Move on. Uh, I've been trying it out. There are a couple of people, I don't know, somebody over here and, and so on, uh, out in the hall here. The reaction is absolutely visceral when you try these things on. And I think in vocational learning especially, we have a real opportunity of using cheap $300 technology to do something we've never been able to do before. Not only teach real competencies quickly, also assess those competencies, and also even certify people for jobs using these simulations because that's exactly what happens in flight simulation and we're about to see something big in vocational learning. This thing will be launched in 2015. So I've given you some examples there of adaptive learning, interactive institute where online degrees are actually better than the campus degrees, Oculus Rift, assessment and so on because the bottom line here I think is that there is an irreversible change happening and it has happened with all the examples I've shown and it's institutional inertia that's a problem, and that's a real problem, and it's not a bad problem, it just happens to be the problem, but we are looking at increasingly the, the decentralization of education, there's no doubt about that at all, the disintermediation and the democratization of education, and that's important. Not necessarily, I don't want to destroy the good colleges and universities that exist in our country, but it's no solution at all for the developed world, none at all, and until we get to grips with finding cheaper solutions, and that will only come through scalable technology. It's an irreversible process. We won't solve that moral problem. Resistance in that sense, I think, is futile. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Very much, Donald. That was absolutely fascinating. I think I've been converted to moots <laughs> to Good. start with. So I'm sure there'll be uh, some questions for Donald if you just want to put up your hand. Or stun have you stunned him? <laughs> Provocative question. Have you sure, just yeah. delivered a linear one hour lecture? Yeah, yeah. And if so, why? Yeah. Well, that's right. It, I get asked that question every time, so no. Oh. 
I, first of all, almost everything I do in my adult life uh, in any numbers is online. I gave a very talk, uh, it's a reasonably famous talk on, uh, on, on YouTube called Don't Lecture Me, where I made this point at the beginning. I gave that talk in front of an organization in England called Alt, and it was all higher education professors, and I got absolutely slaughtered on Twitter at, at the time because I dared. Actually, things have moved on. People, you can say, oh, let's not lecture. People go, yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> but then I got slaughtered. But I got 20,000 views on YouTube. What is more important to me in terms of this message I'm trying to get across? The couple of hundred people that are in here or the 20,000 people that you get on YouTube? It's no context. You know, if I write a blog, well, I've been writing a blog for years, you know, two million hits, hundreds of thousands of people. That's, my action is online primarily, but I'm not against lectures, funnily enough, universally. I actually think there's a role for lecture, which is this sort of thing, which is a sort of shift gear. I think you know, a practicing physicist should lecture at least once, but I don't think they should be slabbing out lectures on 101 physics every week for a term that they've been doing for 10 years. That's the mistake. I think seeing a live expert, uh, whether it's gas fitting or a theoretical physics, is a good thing for students. But I don't think it's a good student thing for students for those people to be standing up and talking at them relentlessly term after term. I just don't think it is. So there's no problem in certain types of lectures, which are more motivational, evangelistic, the sort of thing I've been doing perhaps, than the slabbing it out. And let's be honest, that's what's happening. Let's not kid ourselves. That has been happening for uh, as long as universities have been around and hasn't changed that much. There are some good enlightened places where it's very different, I think, where they're recording lectures. Eric Mazur at Harvard stops his lectures every five minutes, all that stuff. Good. Happy. Any more questions? Hi. I, I, I thought that was, uh, that, that was great and I learned a lot and I'm rather like everyone else. I sort of think, oh, why have we carried on doing it this way so long? But then I slightly take the analogy with, uh, with let's say, classical music concerts where you can have the recording, which is always perfect, um, and you can go to the concert where things are not so perfect but quite often are um, uh, m more interesting in that way, particularly for, let's say, arts lectures where people might want to argue. So there is interaction, if you see on the web, um, where, of course, you can tweet and Twitter and you know, all that sort of malarkey, but it's not quite the same as having a stand-up row with the man and the woman in the room, if you see what I mean. I mean, it doesn't yeah. have to be a row, a discussion. I understand, yeah. Well, f first of all, it's a very good example of this. Now, I love music and I love theatre and I love drama and I'm a trustee of a big arts organization in England. But let's take music. I think the amount of music I listen to compared to live music is probably on a ratio of 200,000 to one. I think the theater with drama, I mean, I go to a lot of movies and I watch a lot of television and I watch a lot of box sets and so on. And I go to the theater, but the ratio is probably 100,000 to one. So in a sense, your examples prove my case. Surely the vast, but I'm not against killing theater, killing live music. I'm going to Latitude for three days in July and I will have a great time there. But the dominant model for the delivery of music is online. You know, I have a Sonos system and I can type up any track any minute of the day and I absolutely love it. And that's what my kids want in the future. The, you know, do we want to go back in a time when the only time you could listen to music is going and listening to a 70 piece orchestra and paying through the nose because only about 10 out of 100 people could afford it? I think that would be disastrous. I think it's, that numbers game has been played out. Online is cheaper. It's not that what, even, even if it's superior to go to the theater, it's still better to have an inferior experience that gets to millions of more people. The, the, often the case in the educational research I read, you get an intervention and it goes, yeah, it wasn't quite as good as the classroom experience. You go, well, that doesn't really matter if it only costs 2p to deliver this and it costs 1,000 pounds a day to deliver it in the school because people don't do cost-effectiveness analysis very well. And that's the problem. You can't just do that comparison, this is better than that. Because that may be even inferior to that, but a lot cheaper. Like CDs compared to a live classical concert. But surely we need the vast majority of music delivered on CDs as opposed to live orchestras because it's just ridiculously and cripplingly expensive. And education has become cripplingly expensive. So um, just to recap everything you said, and especially just one last question. Ah, sorry, I lost you. <laughs> just to <laughs> recap everything you said, and especially the last few comments, uh, it's literally not just abandon this. 
It's more courses for courses. Find yeah. what works in what circumstances. So what we actually need is to think about what are the possibilities and find exactly what we're trying to do and find the right tool to do that. So don't go entirely, don't go entirely practical, don't do entire lectures, don't do entirely online. Yeah. The combination of all of those things is really what delivers best. So I think what we need is more sessions like that to find out what actually is possible yeah, to start I thinking of totally what we can do. There is, there is a beautiful sort of conceptual framework for this around the concept of blended learning, and it's been around for a while. Everybody knows that phrase, blended learning. But don't be too, you, your point is well made here. With blended learning, people have a sort of Velcro model, you know, oh, we'll have a bit of the classroom and a bit of online stuff, we'll stick them together, you know. It's hopelessly non optimized. If you're going to take the blended learning thing, which is what you were talking about there, let's pick the optimal blend for the giving set of learners we've got, the type of learning, and the resources we've got. They're the three big variables. Uh, that doesn't actually happen much, because you really have to go back to scratch and redesign your whole course, which is what you should be doing. If you take blended learning seriously and look for an optimal blend of all the things I've been talking about, because you have limited resource, perhaps limited bandwidth, all sorts of things, limited storage, you can still come up with an optimized blend, but it hardly ever happens. What we do is stick bits of technology on top of the cake like cherries. It's adjunct behavior, and that's why the fundamental courses don't change and why it tends to drop off and you don't get the kudos for, for what you do. You have to and there's loads of research around this. Don't just do the cherry on the cake thing, redesign the course. But you have to have senior leadership, you have to have the whole, you know, you have to, there's a whole change management process around this. And I know that sounds like corporate managerialism, but actually it's true. You do have to change people's attitudes, you do need leadership, you do have to plan a process whereby the change in human beings happen as well as the technology change. So I wholly agree with what you said there. It's not abandoning everything. It's, I mean, let's face it, hardly any of the new stuff is in there anyway. <laughs> you know, let's not pretend it's alive and kicking. It's sort of kept at bay. Of course, the students are using it anyway. It's like water, it's leaking into the system all over the place. And it's not all good. I really abhor the use of tablets in schools, you know. I don't think any, why any student would buy a tablet in a university is beyond me. You can't code. Who would write a thesis on a tablet? You know, but we keep on taking the tablets. There are some really bad things happening in technology. And I'm not a big fan in primary schools and secondary schools of shoving technology into classrooms. Even though, you know, I'm not a technological determinist. I don't think teachers should teach. Good teachers need to teach, need to do what Russell did. They need to give good feedback to pupils, keeping an eye on them. The technology often just plops in the middle, parachuted in, and acts as a barrier. I think there's a much bigger argument in colleges and universities for it because they use it anyway. But I think the laptop is a superior a superior sense uh, set of affordances in that sense. And if anybody's buying, I don't see why anybody would buy iPads for their students. It make, make no sense to me whatsoever. They can do hardly a damn thing on it, apart from look at stuff, because that's what the iPad was designed to do. It's a consumer device, not a producer device. Sorry, I went off on one now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I very much enjoyed that presentation, um, but all too often I've come to conferences like this and I've really enjoyed the presentation um, and nodded along with it um, and gone away and really not done any diff anything different as a result of having heard the presentation. Um, and I think it's worth saying that a lot of us probably work within contexts which you've um, described and, you know, being critical of and we're probably all critical um, to a greater or lesser extent of the constraints that exist within the institutions that we um, work within. So really I was going to try and turn it back on you and say if there was one thing that you could wish that everyone in this room went out and did differently as a result of your presentation, what would it be? Well, a good question. I think it would be, read there's one thing that I sort of changed my life a little bit on this front. And you know, I've been implementing big projects for 30 odd years in higher education, colleges, schools, and corporates. And the one thing that I think really, and funnily enough, a lot of those things, you know, I was, I was, my, it was paying my mortgage. I had to make them work or else I wouldn't get paid and because you needed people to come back. And it was the concept of change management. And it's a paper by a guy called Cotter. And 
he is a sort of leading academic at Harvard on change management. And his little paper in the Harvard Business Review is the best ever selling reprint in the Harvard Business Review. And his eight step thing on change management is absolutely fascinating because most people go in and you get departmental meetings and panels and you get your plan out and you blah, 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 blah. And he's saying that's the last thing you should be doing. His very first thing, his very first step in his eight step is create a sense of urgency. It's a very sort of, it sounds odd in a way, but it's very important. Now, that, what, what does that mean? Well, I don't know what it means for you and your college, school, institution, but in some institutions, it's a drastic, in, in England, in FE at the moment, it's a 17.5% budget cut. That is absolutely, the, there's a group in Feltag reporting directly to the minister with a 10% target for the use of technology and further education colleges. That's all driven by budget cuts. So sometimes the sense of urgency is just we don't have enough money to do it the old way. We need newer, cheaper ways on scale. Uh, but there may, be other, there may be other reasons for this as well. Attracting new students, moving your college into new domains with new courses. There are all sorts of things that create the sense of urgency. But Cotter was cute because he did loads of empirical research showing that that really mattered. You didn't go anywhere unless you had that. And then the vision comes along, and then the plan is further down the line. And that means you need leadership. And then what he calls the, the coalition of the powerful. If you don't have the IT department and the vice chancellor or the principal of the college and, and on board, you're going nowhere. You're going nowhere because you're trying to be emergent and you just hit that layer of impervious rock. So I think just be more aware of change management and then try and convince people that that's the way to go. And I've seen that work time and time again. There's a really wonderful woman called Julie Stone at the University of Derby and I remember when she first started and she implemented that and now, she, now her on, the University of Derby online has loads of students. It's an indispensable part of the university and it's a whole faculty. She sits at the faculty table having the online faculty. And of course, the other faculty, she did a clever thing. Her sense of urgency was new students and new markets. And she went to the Far East, got those students, and made sure they all did the degrees online and then get sucked into the main university. And then she's a survivor. She's building and is now indispensable to that organization. So you have to think about how you're going to do this politically. And you're just playing around with the technology. But as an individual, it's another thing. As an individual, play with this stuff. You know, I'm really tired of hearing it, you know, education. You go, oh, it's not the technology, it's learning. I know, I know. But love the technology, don't hate it. You know, you do go to technology and education conferences and you get people on the floor saying, oh, MOOCs are... And you go, well, if this was a pet food conference, you wouldn't have people paying to turn up and saying, I don't like pets. <laughs> you know, why? You know, and it was intrinsic in the education system as a sort of suspicion and dislike almost to technology that really surprises me a lot. It really surprises me, you know, because you don't get it in other domains... You know that if you go to a tech conference, it's people who like tech and turn up because it's a tech conference. But in education, we still have this deep suspicion. We don't embrace it. We still hold it at arm's length, which is why I think just playing with it is so important. I don't want to hear if, you, if you're not on Facebook, don't tell me I shouldn't be on Facebook because you don't know the first thing about it. <laughs> That's my view. And all that sneering attitude towards social media that you get from people who are just older and don't know much about it. Stay silent. Let us go on with changing the world then. You know, I don't, we don't need the sneering. Sorry, I was getting uh, carried away again. <laughs> okay, Donald, thank you very much. That was absolutely fabulous. No problem. Great way to start the afternoon. Thank you.